So we have finished our study of the terrestrial planets and now we get to dive into the outer solar system planets and explore the Jovians, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, right away, just looking at the sizes and colors of these planets, we can, we can kind of subgroup the Jovian planets into uh, two groups, Jupiter and Saturn being one of them, sharing a lot of you know, physical similarities in terms of size, shape, color, shape. Why am I saying that? And the um, other planets, Neptune and Uranus also resemble one another, especially in terms of color. So we'll kind of dig and figure out why those two categories kind of subgroup off of the Jovian planets. All right, so starting out on the physical properties of our Jovian planets, the first thing to notice uh, is that their orbital distances are all quite large. And this is especially true if you look at this kind of more full picture of all of the contents of the solar system. We see that the inner solar system uh, is pretty you know, closely spaced together. And then the outer solar system is much farther spaced. So there's much more distance between each planet in the outer solar system than between each planet in the inner solar system. And they're also kind of physically separated from the inner solar system by the asteroid belt. So this asteroid belt could be kind of a failed planet um, that's unable to collect under its own gravity. Uh, so it may be that you know, those, those asteroids are essentially old planetesimals floating around in the kind of between inner and outer solar system. And maybe that could have been a, another terrestrial planet if they had all been able to gather up together. Um, but as we'll see, the very large gravity of Jupiter is able to cause disturbances that causes the asteroid belt to, for example, not coalesce. And it also causes disturbances to the motion of other bodies that throws them into the inner solar system. So for a lot of reasons, these Jovian planets are really important to our experience here in the inner planets. Okay, so just looking at a table of the key characteristics, um, what we notice just right away is that the Jovians are very massive, they're very large, um, and they have very long years because they're so far from the sun. So their you know, semi-major axis is proportional to their um, orbital period, and so therefore they all have very long years. Uh, they have very short days on the other hand, so you might expect such a large object to spin really slowly, but actually they spin really quickly compared to the inner planets. And finally, they have very low densities. Uh, the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed and things that are lighter than water can float on it. So Saturn is actually uh, has a low enough density that it would float on water. And so these densities being so much lower than the terrestrial planets point to a big difference in the composition of outer and inner planets. Okay, um, one more point I wanna make about the mass of these large planets is that the, if you look at the total solar system and add up its, its mass, then there's about 330,000 Earth masses within the entire solar system. Uh, you could also express that in terms of the sun. And if you do that, you get 1.0014. So it's pretty clear that you know the sun has one solar mass. And so there's 0.0014 solar masses left over. So the sun occupies the vast majority of all the mass in the solar system. And if you take everything that's not sun, that leaves 466 Earth masses and Jupiter contains 68% of all of that mass. So in terms of all the mass that could be used for making any planets, uh, Jupiter has more than two thirds. Uh, and in general, the outer solar system, if you just add up all of the outer planets has a 95% of the non-sun mass. So the terrestrial planets are actually really insignificant in the grand scheme of at least the mass of the solar system. Um, another really basic property that we can look at for the Jovians is their axial tilt. So how does their rotation axis uh, deviate from their orbital axis? And let's just compare them to all the planets we've seen so far. So for the terrestrials, um, most of these are you know, fairly close to vertical. Earth and Mars about 23, 25 degrees. Venus 177 is a little bit misleading. Its axis is still fairly vertical. It's only a few degrees off of being perfectly upside down. And Jupiter actually has a very small axial tilt as well. Neptune, uh, similar axial tilt as Earth and Mars. 
and Saturn as well. So you might expect that all of these planets would experience similar seasonal variations. But as we saw before, the axial tilt of Uranus is 98 degrees. So completely different. Um, and the reason for the axial tilt of Uranus being so high and the axial tilt of Venus being so high might be related. They might both be related to collisions in the early solar system. So because Saturn has a reasonably large axial tilt, uh, we see it differently in different parts of its orbit around the sun. Um, so what that means is that if we point our telescopes at it, sometimes we see the uh, rings kind of bisecting Saturn, but other times they appear to sort of be looping around the entire planet because we're essentially seeing it uh, more from below. So Uranus's axial tilt is extreme and um, all of its moons, and it has many small moons, orbit around its equator. This is also its ring system. So all the Jovian planets have rings, not just Saturn, uh, but for most of the other planets, they're fairly small, especially compared to Saturn's rings. And so all of these, the ring material uh, and the moons all orbit around the equator of the planet, just like they do with the other Jovians. So the entire system is sideways, not just the planet itself. And as we've seen before, as you explored in the homework in order to apply your understanding of seasons, um, Uranus has really weird seasons um, because it's so sideways and because its orbit is so long, it spends about 21 years receiving sunlight at either its South Pole or its North Pole. And then during the sort of spring and fall seasons, it experiences uh, a more normal day, right? A solar day that's equal to its sidereal day. Um, but <clears throat> this is true only for latitudes near the equator. Um, it's difficult for us to see any effects of seasonal changes on Saturn. So why might that be? 